Amen. Please be seated. Welcome. Uh, as, as I think Ben mentioned, I'm, I'm a little under the weather today, so hopefully we'll make it through. And if we don't, we'll just end early. I think that's how it works, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, we're tur- go ahead and start turning in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we're continuing our series called Refocus, uh, and the whole point of this whole series is to help us refocus our minds and our hearts on who Christ is and what it means to be his church, his people. Um, and as, as Pastor Ben mentioned last week, the first four verses of chapter three are really kind of a hinge for the rest of the book. And uh, we'll continue to refer back to that the next few sermons. There's not that many left, but uh, each time that becomes kind of a foundation for the instructions that Paul gives in all of chapter 3 and chapter 4. So we're in uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17 this morning, and we're going to be talking about worshiping God in all things. Somebody heard this week that I was going to be preaching on worship and said, so you're going to wear a, an actual full suit of armor then, right, for all of the uh, actions that will follow. And I said, no, 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 it's not, it's not that bad. But uh, it is a topic that we know can be quite heated in the church. What does worship look like? What should it look like? Uh, and and our pastors really the people who should tell us what it looks like? Uh, <laughs> because that's another piece of that puzzle. Um, But what we're going to see here in this passage is that worship has a lot less to do with the things we typically associate with worship and a lot more to do with what we do the rest of our lives, the rest of our time, the rest of our energies. Um, So I mentioned last week we had that hinge section um, and, and really, we've moved from the theology of who Christ is and what it means to be his people into, so then what do we do to, to, to live out that theology? So it's very practical what, what follows. Uh, we saw that the first step involved looking to things above instead of things below and included a list of things below to put to death in verse 5, and to shed in verse 9. This week, we're picking up with a therefore, which is part of why I'm doing so much explanation, because that therefore points back to all of those things. The first half of the book, those first four verses in chapter 3, specifically the putting off portion that Pastor Ben preached on last week, all of those things have been building up to the therefore, this is what you should do, that, that we pick up with this week. And, it, and, and it, there's a list of things to put on, to clothe ourselves with. And so it's, it's helpful for understanding what follows to just pick up a little bit. It's almost like when uh, you're watching a TV series and they say previously on at the beginning. And you can skip that part, but, but it's usually, unless you're binge watching, it's usually helpful to watch that, you know, 30 seconds or a minute of what was on the last episode, the recap. So you go, oh yeah, that's right. That's where we were. And so we're going to do that with the end of the passage from last week. We're going to look at chapter verses 9 through 11 quickly, just to remind ourselves. So where did Paul leave us at the end of our time together last week? So I'm going to read beginning in verse 9, take a break, and then read 12 through 17. Paul says, do not lie to each other, so that's part of the list, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. So he's, he's suggesting this is something that's already happened. Even though he's instructing you to do it, he's also saying, but you've done this. Since you've done this, this is what this looks like. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here... There is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. 
And, and that really sets the stage for how he's going to unpack what we should do in this next section, because it relates to this, this whole concept of you've put off those things, you put on these new things, and oh, by the way, in doing that, you've become part of a big family of people who've all done the same thing. And, and that's really important in how we consider and process what he has to say in the next five verses. Okay, so there's, there's our little recap. Uh, now, let's look to, to verses 12 through 17. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for who he is and what he has done and continues to do. Lord, we praise you for who you are. As we come to your word this morning, I pray that you would speak through it to each of us. I pray that you'd give me strength and energy and focus to say the things that you've put on my heart to bring before us this morning. And I pray that we would be able to to hear from you together, to receive your word, to be changed by it as your people. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as has been, uh, I think, I don't remember, I can't keep track. Somebody said, we have the kids in here with us today. That's communion Sunday tradition, and I'm so thankful for that. And part of the reason I'm thankful for that is because when we do communion Sunday, I try to keep my sermons to two points instead of three. And that's really helpful for me today when I'm low energy. <laughs> So we're going to try to keep it focused in, and we're going to talk about two things, living in Christ and living in community. So we're going to start with living in Christ and then finish with living in community. And then we get to take communion together. How amazing is that? Uh, We get to do a little practicing of of what's being preached. Um, And so we're thankful for that. Uh, We also, just, just to run through other traditions and things, at the end of our service, we take up a benevolence offering, and that's another piece of living in community is we give towards the potential needs that are among us. And those, those get used for exactly that uh, and only that. And uh, it's just a really neat way of imaging what we're talking about, a piece of what we're talking about today. Uh, so we'll have that, and then we'll get to fellowship to get, well, I won't join you for the fellowship portion. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have coffee and bagels and things over in Faith Hall and just a nice time of fellowship together, living out the in-community piece of what we're talking about this morning. So I think it's just really fitting that that's where we've landed in our series today, is on a Sunday when we really do lean into being community as we gather as God's people here at Sanctuary Bible Church. Uh, As Paul, in this passage, makes this transition, he can't get away from that major theme that we've seen over and over and over again throughout the book, which is that Christ is 
everything. He's the center of everything, and, and we're in him, and he's in us, and that's what makes everything actually work in terms of what he's been laying out in this book. And so as he returns to the positive side of the contrast between what you put off and now what we've put on, he begins with a reminder of who his readers are. And it's an easy reminder to just skip over because it fits with a lot of the formulas that we see at the beginning of Paul's letters. But here it is in the middle of one of his letters. So he says, therefore, as God's chosen people. Usually, Paul to God's chosen people. That's at the beginning. But now here in the middle, he's reminding us, he's writing, as God's chosen people, holy, set apart, dearly loved. So this more active things that God has done, this fits with the general biblical practice from beginning to end of, of basing commands on what God has already done, he chose you. He set you apart. You are dearly loved by him as those people, those people that God has already acted on behalf of, clothe yourselves with these things. So that's the starting point is, is rem- excuse me, is remembering who you are in Christ. It's not, here's a list to do on your own. It's it's reminding ourselves that these are things that we can only do because of who Christ is and he's in us. So then what do we clothe, clothe ourselves with? Well, there's this list of five things to start with and then some sentences that add some more things. Uh, And that seems to correspond in in some way to the two lists of five things that we put off. Imagine that. There's some symmetry there, connectedness. But these five things match up with who Jesus is, his character. So what do we see there? We see clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, He's the ultimate example of humility, right? Of gentleness and patience. We're ruled by his peace. And then we have the message of Christ dwelling in us richly, doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Even our thankfulness is expressed three times in verse 15. 15, 16, and 17, even that is expressed through him at the end of verse 17. Our our gratitude is expressed primarily in living Christ-like lives, and that itself, that gratitude that spills out into how we live is worship. That's, That's how we worship him. We We choose what we do. We choose how we live based on who he is and recognizing that that's what it means to live in him. We were dead, now we're alive in Christ, so how do you live? Just You just go back to the way that you used to live before? No, you you live in him, and that is worship. And we see that, again, this is a concept that is not new to this passage or even to the New Testament because that's what we saw throughout Deuteronomy is that God said, look, here's what I've done. I've set you apart. I've rescued you. I've given you new life. I'm, I'm giving you all these things, and now this is how you live that life. This is how to live the life that is, is blessed by God. It's it by living in accordance with his character. And so it's not a means to grace, it's a a response to God's grace, is that we live lives that are, are, are worshipful. They're filled with worship of him. There's this, this term clothed, and then he, he uses the beginning, and then when he gets to love, he says, above all, put on love. And, and a lot of people love to stretch that analogy a little bit and talk 
about, so what is he meaning? Is he talking about importance? Is he talking about this, that, or the other thing? And, and the big picture that I found most helpful is, look, if, you're, if you put together an outfit with these five components, and then you put a coat on top, it might tie everything together, or a belt might tie everything together, or some other accessory. I'm not a fashionista, so I don't actually know how you tie an outfit together. But the idea is this last piece that pulls it all together and, and makes it work. And that's what is being expressed when he says, above all things, put on love. It holds them all together in unity. That, that, that he's not here, though I'm going to try to make an appeal that he is in a minute. Don't worry. I'll confuse you, I'm sure. But he's not really talking here about the unity of the body. He's talking about the unity of the virtues that he's expressed and saying that love is what brings all those together. So you can be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient, but if you don't have love, what good are those things? But if you do all those things in love, now it's, it ties it all together. Uh, and that's going to be a principle that applies in the next portion as well when we talk about some of the forms and functions of how you do that, is that if you do any of that without the love piece, it kind of all falls apart. Um, and so before we move to that second piece, I just want to stop and ask a few questions. What are you clothed with? I don't mean these clothes. I mean the spiritual clothes that Paul's talking about. What are you filling your mind and heart with day in and day out? And does that match Christ's character? Are you filling yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and patience and bearing with each other and forgiveness and remembering how Christ forgave you and love and peace? What do you give your attention, your respect, your time, and your resources to? Because that is who or what you are worshiping with your life. So you might come in here on a Sunday morning and sing songs and, and pray and then go out and forget all of this and put on all that other stuff from last week and, and live the dead life. Or you can worship God with your life. Those are the options that Paul's putting forth. And he doesn't really even present them as options. He's, saying, he's like, why, why? Why would you put that other stuff on? You, you already, as we read in the recap, you've, you've already taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So that's what it, that's, so, so go and do that. That's, that's, that's the first part, living in Christ. But the second part is living in community. And they're really, they're really integrated. That's something we've been saying pretty much this whole series, is that it's really hard to separate out the parts where Paul's talking about Christ being everything and what it means to be the church and to, to do this life together in community. And so we find that again here. And, and the reason I say that is because all, all of Paul's commands in this section are about how we approach and interact with each other. There's, there's none of this that you can do without interacting with another person. I mean, I guess you can be kind to yourself, gentle to yourself, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about how you interact with people. He begins by defining us as a group rather than individuals, right? He says, remember, look, therefore, as God's chosen people, not, he doesn't say, therefore, as, as one single individual chosen by God who happens to see occasionally some others who were also chosen by God, as God's chosen, as the whole group. And then he talks about things like conflict management, and unity, and being ruled by peace, 
but not just any peace, but the peace of Christ as members of one body who were called to peace. There's a, there's a tying together there that you can't take apart from the, the theology piece that we talked about in, in the first point, that you have to live in community in order to live out these commands. This community is supposed to be saturated by, in verse 16, the message of Christ, also known as the gospel. Teaching, admonishing with wisdom. This, this, this whole series points us back to other parts in the book. So when we talk about the peace of Christ, there's this wonderful verse at the end of uh, a description of Christ in chapter 1 where he says... Um, it's on the other page. He says, uh, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things in, on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That, that peace of Christ is the peace purchased by his blood that reconciles everything to God. And then, and then Paul has already told us about his ministry in, verse, uh, in 128, he says, he is the one we proclaim. How? Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Which is the same list that he gives us. Teaching each other, admonishing each other with wisdom. So what Paul's doing is he's saying, I expect the church to keep doing the work that I started. This is not a unique work to Paul. It's what he expects the church to continue doing long after he'd gone, to keep teaching and admonishing with wisdom. How? Well, there, it, that sentence just keeps going. It doesn't stop. Uh, you do it um, through singing to each other, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Paul is here not, in case anybody's tempted to think he is, referring to styles of music that we know from the modern era. He's referring to the full range of music that was known to him in his era. So he's not pointing out and restricting specific things. This is an all-encompassing list where Paul's saying, whatever you can sing that has this truth in it, that's going to teach and admonish each other with wisdom, do that. that. That's very open. And I'm going to do, this is kind of a sidebar. I don't really know how to describe what, what, what I'm going to do next here. We're going to talk a little bit briefly about, worship, about music and its connection to worship. Because we don't have to do that often, and it is a piece of this passage. Uh, and I feel like before I say anything else, I need to say I love all kinds of music, personally. I am a huge fan of all music. And, and algorithms don't know what to do with me because I like it all. Uh, and, and when people go, well, you mean, every, you, you're, you mean this stuff, right? But not this other stuff. I go, no, 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 that's pretty good too. And every now and then somebody will tell me about some kind of music I've never heard before and, and say, surely you don't mean that. And I go, oh, let me, let me check that out. And I love it. It's great. I love music. Uh, I have, over the course of my life, become proficient in multiple musical instruments associated with very different styles of music. I love music. Worship does not mean music. So that was my, my setup for you. I love music. It's good stuff. Worship does not mean music. Music is a piece of worship. It's a component of worship. It's part of how we worship, but it's not the whole thing. It, we are supposed to use it alongside all the other things to deepen our understanding of who God is and what it looks like to live in light of the gospel. That, that what we sing is, is, first of all, supposed to be to each other. How about that for a, 
uh, change of perspective. What we sing to each other is supposed to remind each other of the message of the gospel. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish with wisdom, singing these songs. That's what it's supposed to look like for us to sing together in worship as a gathered community. That what we sing is much more important than how we sing it. We're supposed to use it as part of that teaching tool, the admonishing tool, which means that I guess not all of our songs can be happy. It's hard to do admonishing with a happy, happy song, huh? How do you correct somebody through a song that's all about the good things? There should be space in what we sing to each other for the, the whole gamut of what we need to do in terms of encouraging each other to stay in Christ. That's, that's what we're about as a church. The greater focus for Paul is not the style, but the overall focus throughout the whole section on how we interact with each other. As if Jesus himself is actually the focus of our church community. That's the idea. That, that we are not gathered here for selfish reasons. We're gathered here for Christ. We're here because of him. And that's supposed to be the focus of everything we do and everything we say, and everything we sing is about who is he? Why do we worship him? And why, when I walk out of here, should I live a life that's worshipful to him? Why shouldn't I just say, well, I checked that off and now I can go back to the things that I prefer to do? When we gather as a community, does the mess of Christ really saturate all that we say, do, and sing? Do our, and I mean here are as a whole, our church community, do our attitudes and words and tone and actions and everything else reflect and amplify Christ? I've only been here a couple years. I'm still new. I'm still figuring things out. I'm still new to pastoral ministry. During that time, because of the nature of our transition and, and a focus on changing some things and turning some things in different direction and all that stuff that happened before I even got here, I have heard all sorts of reasons, some solid, some more speculative, about why people are displeased with our church. None of those has been, they're just too compassionate and kind and gentle and humble and patient. Nobody said they're too much like Jesus. All the complaints have been preferences. What do I like when I come to worship God? Folks, it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about Jesus. We're not here to make people comfortable. We're here to point them to Christ. So there's a lot of things that we're talking about and trying and doing to see how can we reach people who are unlikely to set foot through the doors of our sanctuary. And some of those are going to make us feel uncomfortable. Some of them have already made me feel uncomfortable. One of the, you know, I've been to a lot of different types of churches over the years. Some I've chosen and some I haven't because, well, when I was a kid, I had to go to church with my parents. You're welcome, kids. I had to do it too. Uh, I get it. 
I have not always liked the kind of music or the kind of preaching or the kind of decorations at the churches that I've been a part of. But I wasn't there for those things. I was there to learn of Christ and interact with his people and live that out together with them. You know, when we were in uh, Indonesia, the approach to worship music there is uh, very much, how do we make sure that all our neighbors know that we're worshiping Jesus? (laughs) So they meet in rooms that I think some of them are the size of this stage. And they'll cram 30 or 40 people into this space, and it's made from concrete with a tile floor, and they will use speakers that size and amplify it, turn everything up to 11, because they want anybody out there to hear who who he is and why. And sometimes even the people that lead them in worship cannot sing but they don't care because they're not there for a concert. They're there to worship Jesus and make him known to everyone. Everyone. That's their approach to how they do musical worship. And they like to point out when Muslims gather to sing. No, they don't. When Muslims gather to worship, they don't sing. That's not part of how they worship. They see it as a uniquely Christian aspect of worship to sing praises to God. And so they go, we want them to all hear us singing. Because isn't it amazing that God wants to hear the praises of his people? We live in community by helping each other focus on Jesus and who he is, and then every now and then, teaching and admonishing each other with wisdom and saying, hey, friend, you're putting on those old dirty clothes again. I thought we threw those away. Christ and his character. It's amazing. We can do a lot to make this place look and sound and feel like you're just going to any old anything. But the list of things that Paul says to put on are as countercultural as it gets. When we talk about, and I'm going to do something, I, I'm going to do this next week anyway, so just buckle up. Next week, we're going to be talking about men and women. I don't do that very often because I think the vast majority of discipleship is the same for men and women because Christ is the same and he's called us to be like him. So most, the vast majority of what it looks like to be conformed to his image is going to be the same for men and women. But right now in our culture, there's a big battle going on about the differences between men and women. And those who want, even among us believers, who want to hold on to the distinctions that are biblical are emphasizing things that are not when it comes to masculinity. Because this list, if I go on popular talk radio today and say that to be a man is to be What's the list again? Compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient, bearing with each other, forgiving each other, and above everything else, putting on love. They're going to laugh me out of the place. This is who Jesus is. This is who we are called to be as men who follow him. And oh, by the way, the women are also called to be this way as women who follow him, that this is what it means to put on Christ, to treat each other with respect and patience and recognize who you used to be and how much work God had to do to get you to where you are today and to give a little bit of that to whoever it is that's bothering you right now. And that's life in community. 
I could, I could stand here and talk about this all day, but I'm not. Uh, apparently, I got energy just from that. So praise God. Hallelujah. We are going to move into a time of communion. As I mentioned, so appropriate. Uh, and I'm going to actually do something different just in case for some reason I can't get back up here. I'm going to read the communion passage today now as the band comes up. So you guys come on up and get in your positions. And then I'm also not going to be serving communion. You're welcome. Uh, there's a couple men who have agreed to do that. And uh, you know the instructions, hopefully, by now. If you're visiting with us, I'll repeat them. We're just going to, as you're ready, you come up the side aisles, you receive a couple cups. They're stacked. You take it yourself so that you don't get somebody else's germs on your cup. Uh, one has a cracker in it. One has juice in it. You take them back to your seat and wait, and we'll all take that together. But I'm going to read the passage now, and it's different because it's actually from Colossians. I'm going to read from Colossians 1. I was going to start in verse 15, and then I looked at 13. So I'm going to actually go to Paul's prayer and start in verse 9. I could go further back, but I'm just going to read a chunk here. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, why? So that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." The Son, that Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. We gather to proclaim that message every time we gather, and we celebrate it in a particular way by taking these elements that point us to his sacrifice on the cross.